Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we decided that it would be uh, beneficial to you to have Alan Kruger, the chair of the uh, President's uh, Council of Economic Advisors, uh, to join me here today. As you know, Alan co-authored a report, uh, a new report from the White House on the impact of middle class tax hikes uh, if they were to occur on retailers and consumer spending. Uh, that report is available on whitehouse.gov if you haven't read it. Uh, he uh, authored this report for Cyber Monday, and I hope that the uh, extra time you had uh, it, during the delay uh, led to some more purchases online. I'm sure using private computers and not your company's computers. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Alan, uh, who has uh, a statement at the top and can take your questions on uh, the importance of extending those tax cuts for the middle class uh, because of the uh, effect on consumer spending and uh, confidence and on retailers. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, let me make a, a few remarks about, about this report. Uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, together with the National Economic Council, uh, considered what would happen if the Bush era tax cuts uh, for the middle class uh, are not extended. Uh, as you know, the President uh, has uh, supported an extension of the middle class tax cuts for families earning below $250,000 a year. Um, and uh, what we did was to use pretty standard uh, economic techniques uh, to say uh, what would happen to uh, middle class families after tax income if the middle class tax cuts are not extended. And uh, as a result of the decline in their after tax income, what would happen to their purchases? And the typical middle class family uh, with uh, uh, two children uh, would face about a $2,200 tax increase uh, if the tax uh, cuts are not extended uh, for the middle class. Um, in the aggregate, we calculated that this would reduce consumption by about $200 billion. To put that in some perspective, uh, that would reduce the growth of consumption by 1.7 percentage points uh, and shave 1.4 percentage points off of GDP growth next year. Uh, our estimates are quite close to estimates of private sector forecasts uh, and also quite close to the Congressional Budget Office Office's estimate uh, that GDP growth would be reduced by 1.3 percentage points uh, next year if the middle class tax cuts are not extended. Uh, we also looked at which sectors uh, would be affected uh, by uh, a $200 billion reduction in uh, consumer spending. Um, and you can see it spread quite broadly uh, across housing, across services, which include things like uh, uh, paying for cell phones, uh, groceries, durable goods, uh, auto purchases, and so on. Um, I think evidence like this is one reason why uh, retailers are so concerned uh, that uh, Congress has not yet extended the middle class tax cuts. The Senate passed an extension uh, of the tax cuts uh, and um, it seems to be the thing that we can all agree on, uh, that uh, middle class families should see an extension uh, of these tax cuts uh, and that would uh, help the economy uh, in the coming year. So I'm happy, uh, happy to take questions with that. Yeah. Alan, uh, thanks for joining <coughs> us. Uh, the report also suggests that lower consumer confidence could even affect uh, holiday retail sales. And, and initial reports seem to be that that you've had record retail sales in the early part of the, the holiday season. What what accounts for that? Do you really think that, that there could be a, a, a slide uh, after this? And, and what responsibility does the White House have in, in helping that consumer confidence uh, over the next few days? It's a great question, and uh, I think we have a lot of evidence that consumer confidence does affect consumer spending and does affect the economy. Uh, our estimates do not take into account any change in consumer confidence. We just look at the effect on incomes and through the effect on after-tax income, uh, the effect of uh, not extending the middle class tax cuts on family spending and uh, how that circulates through the economy. Uh, businesses would see less revenue, they'd make less profit, that would affect their spending and we kind of take those second round effects into account as well. Uh, you're right that consumer confidence could have an independent effect. Uh, we need to look back no further than uh, last year 
when uh, Congress didn't raise the debt ceiling in an orderly fashion at what happened to consumer confidence and how that affected our economy. Uh, so uh, one of the many reasons why I think it's important that Congress extend the middle class tax cuts without delay, without drama, is because it will help to maintain uh, the increase in consumer confidence that we've seen since August of 2011. And the report points out that the latest measures of consumer confidence uh, are now at their highest level in five years. Uh, and I think it's important that we can build on that progress. You didn't fear this report hurting consumer confidence? Because essentially, isn't this report sort of, hey, the sky may, is going to fall, the sky is going to fall in six weeks. Were you worried at all that this would hurt consumer confidence? You know, what uh, we're focused on at uh, CEA and NEC in the administration is trying to strengthen the economy, uh, try to put us on a fiscally sustainable path to do this in a balanced way. Uh, and a very big step uh, in terms of strengthening the economy, uh, having a balanced approach to our uh, longer run deficit issues would be to extend the middle class tax cuts. Alan, can I ask you uh, real brief questions on the Republican side and the Democratic side in terms of impediments to a deal? On the Republican side, there seems to be people like Eric Cantor digging in and, and still saying, don't want to raise taxes. But are you encouraged by Saxby Chambliss, Lindsey Graham, other Republicans saying they're open to it? You know, my expertise, as you know, is in the economics of these issues. And I can tell you as an economist, I think a balanced approach is the right approach uh, for the economy. I think the approach the President laid out in his budgets uh, which rely on a mix of uh, spending cuts uh, and uh, additional revenue from uh, higher income families. Again, through a balanced approach of both uh, higher tax rates as well as reduction in, uh, in, in deductions uh, would help to strengthen the economy. There are some Democrats on the left, like Peter DeFazio, <clears throat> saying, go off the cliff, which is obviously the opposite of what your report is saying, because they believe the President will have an even stronger hand in January when Democrats have more seats on, on the Hill. Are you concerned about that kind of message, sending mixed signals from the Democratic Party? Some saying go off the cliff, the White House putting out a report saying, God, don't do that. You know, again, Ed, my, my expertise is on uh, what's the best approach for the economy, how will various uh, proposals affect the economy. So I, I, I won't comment on the political strategies. Scott? Is this the best approach for the economy, or could you get more bang for the buck if the government just took this extra revenue and spent it on infrastructure or something like that, or extended unemployment benefits? You know, if you go back to the President's budget, uh, he has a mix of pr programs uh, like what you're suggesting to strengthen the economy. Um, he had uh, in his budget with the American Jobs Act, part of which passed, and the part that didn't pass he reproposed to invest more in infrastructure, uh, to hire more teachers. Uh, that would help the economy in the short run. But middle class families have been uh, struggling over the past decades. Um, and uh, if you look at this recovery, I think one could tell a story that the economy has been recovering uh, in large part because middle class families have been feeling more uh, confident because their prospects have improved. Uh, that's helped uh, them to maintain consumption. 69% uh, of GDP growth over the last 13 quarters has been a result of uh, greater consumer spending, primarily driven by the middle class. So uh, uh, I think that the best way to strengthen the economy is through a mix of policies uh, that uh, support the economy in the near term, uh, like the President proposed in investing more in infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, putting us on a, a sustainable fiscal path, and as well as protecting the middle class from, from uh, tax increases that would take effect uh, in January uh, if Congress doesn't act. You were just talking about consumption. The payroll tax holiday will end in January, and you were just describing the reasons why consumers and economy have been growing. Is the president satisfied that the holiday should end, and then folks will see their uh, paychecks go down? Or can you describe what CEA thinks the effect on consumption and growth would be when it does end? Uh, well, just to go, go back, the president fought for the extension of the payroll tax cut, and I remember uh, last Christmas, everyone had to change their plans because uh, it uh, took a while uh, for Congress to go along uh, with the extension of the uh, payroll tax cut. And I think if you look over the past year, the payroll tax cut has uh, helped middle class families and has helped to support, uh, support the economy, support consumption. There are many uh, tax provisions that are expiring at the end of the year, uh, and the President has said that the payroll tax cut, among others, should be on, uh, on the table. Do you think it has more economic bang for buck than these income tax rates? 
Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't have a really good answer for you because the report is just focused on the uh, uh, extension of the middle class income tax cuts um, and um, uh, not on the payroll tax cut. Uh, there are some considerations that would require uh, serious study. For example, uh, we looked at uh, a permanent extension of the payroll, of, of the minimum, sorry, back up. We looked at a permanent extension of the middle class tax cuts. Uh, whereas the payroll tax cuts were explicitly temporary, and the economic effects of those are different. Jim. Um, the report also talks about the alternative minimum tax and a, and a patch for that. Is there a reason or is there a desire in the White House at all to have some, more of a permanent patch for that instead of having to do this every year? Um, you know, I think one of the problems that we face in our tax policy is lack of certainty. and. Uh, for the alternative minimum tax in particular, the fact that it hasn't been indexed for inflation, which causes ad hoc uh, adjustments every year and creates, uh, creates some, uh, some uncertainty. Um, I don't want to go beyond that uh, because that's not something that we, <coughs> that, that we looked into in our, in our report. April? And then I would like to bring in uh, today, Cyber Monday and Black Friday into this equation. Uh, just in basic terms, how would uh, the retail sales from today and Friday uh, help retails. We understand 70% of retail sales go into the economy, directly affect the economy. How does this affect this economy and this economy that we're seeing right now, uh, economic situation now, and then how would it affect if, if, if this were, if, if you were, would not have the middle class tax cuts anymore, and the next year we see situations, right. you know, could you give us today and next year possibilities? Well, retail spending is extremely important for the economy. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, consumption accounts for about 70 percent of our gross domestic product. Uh, to put the $200 billion figure in context, if the middle class tax cuts are not extended and if consumer spending falls by $200 billion next year, uh, that's four times the amount that was spent over the uh, holiday shopping weekend, the Black Friday weekend or four-day period, I guess. It keeps getting longer. Uh, if you go back to last year, where we have, ha have numbers. Uh, so uh, that's a substantial uh, hit to retailers. And we, we cite in the report uh, testimony from many retailers, from Walmart, from Walgreen, from uh, Macy's, uh, and others, their concern uh, and their uh, uh, request that the tax cuts for middle-class families be extended to help their businesses. Peter? Um, you don't uh, look at the other side of the fiscal cliff, the spending side. Of it. Are you doing a study about the economic impact of, of all of these sequester cuts that would go into effect? We continually try to evaluate uh, policies that might take, a, take effect. That's, that, that's sort of our role at, at the CEA. Yes. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're, you, I, th I think you could take it as a yes that important economic policies we're always looking at and trying to uh, uh, look at independent estimates come up with their own estimates of how they would impact the economy? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Alan, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm uh, here to take uh, questions on any subject. Jim. Uh, thanks, Jay. And welcoming Major back. Uh, yes, Major. Welcome. Thank you, Jay. Um, on, on the fiscal cliff, I wonder if you could give us more of a kind of an update on on progress, we saw uh, several key Republicans, Saxby Chambliss, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, Peter King, uh, Lindsey Graham, putting some distance between themselves and Grover Norquist's no tax increase pledge. With that kind of compromise tone coming from Republicans, where's, where's the president <coughs> willing to, to give? Because we've been asking you over and over about the, 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 the tax rates and whether he would uh, uh, instead of cutting uh, or instead of in increasing tax rates, whether he would settle for uh, closing loopholes and, and, and so on. Could you tell us a little bit more about where the president stands on this and, uh, and, and where, what kind of confidence you can give the public that this is going to get done? Well, let me start uh, at the top by saying that some of the comments you mentioned uh, are welcome and they represent what we hope is a, uh, a difference in tone and approach uh, to these problems and a recognition that a balanced uh, approach to deficit reduction 
uh, is the right approach. It's the one that's most beneficial for our economy. It's the one that protects the middle class uh, and strengthens it and creates uh, ladders of opportunity for those who would, uh, who aspire to the middle class uh, to get there. Uh, I would say also that uh, the President has made clear that he will not uh, sign a bill that extends the Bush era tax cuts for those making more than $250,000. He's made that clear. I've made that clear. Others have made it clear. And, and that is a firm position. And the reason for that is uh, very practical. Because you can't, math tells us that you can't uh, get the kind of balanced approach that you need uh, without having uh, rates be part of the equation. It's simply, uh, we haven't seen a proposal that achieves that, a realistic proposal that achieves that. Um, but the President has made clear also that he understands that compromise has to be part of this. And uh, as he demonstrated uh, in the summer of 2011, as he has made clear all this year and in his uh, comments to the press and, and to the nation since the election, uh, you know, he's willing to make tough choices as President uh, in order to achieve that balanced approach to deficit reduction uh, and economic growth that's so important for our future economic uh, potential. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pragmatic, practical approach, and the, and the, and the reality is uh, closing loopholes and ending deductions uh, as an alternative to uh, raising rates on the top 200, uh, top earners, top 2 percent, those making over 250000 sounds good, but you have to look at the, con the, the, the actual contents of those proposals, because uh, the President's made clear in his budget that he is for uh, some of the very things that we're talking about here. He has put forward a cap on deductions of 20, uh, 28 percent, uh, and he has talked explicitly about wanting to reform our tax code. Uh, but but uh, you need to do both, and you need to do it in order to achieve the kind of balance that is essential uh, to setting us on a sustainable path fiscally. But what, what progress has been made? I mean, the, the, the President spoke to the Speaker over the weekend. Mm -hmm. He spoke to Senator Reid over the mm -hmm. weekend. Uh, is, is he confident that, that, uh, that, that there's movement here, or are they still at, at, at odds? Well, yes, I think we remain uh, confident that we can achieve an agreement. Work has to be done. Work is continuing to take place. The President spoke with both uh, Senator Reid and Speaker Boehner over the weekend, as you noted. He'll continue to uh, have outreach with, as he promised he would, uh, with uh, various stakeholders, business leaders and others uh, this week, uh, as well as uh, uh, conversations that are ongoing uh, between his staff and, and, and uh, folks on the Hill. That will continue, and we, we hope to see progress. Any, any new meeting with, with the leaders I, themselves? I, I don't have any like scheduling that. updates, but you know, you stole my thunder a little bit, but yeah, he, he met, he had rather he spoke with uh, uh, Speaker Boehner and, and Senator Reid over the weekend, and uh, you know, he will meet with them uh, at the appropriate time, uh, as well as obviously uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and, and Mitch McConnell. So, you know, the process that he uh, began uh, is continuing. We continue to be optimistic that uh, a balanced approach is achievable. We know what the solutions are. I think it was Senator Corker who said in an op-ed uh, that, you know, one benefit of uh, all the debates we've had and negotiations and discussions over the past uh, couple of years on these issues is that we know what the parameters of uh, a balanced solution to these challenges looks li look like. And uh, they include uh, both spending cuts and revenues uh, and entitlement reforms. Uh, they have to have — all three legs of the stool have to be part of it. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you mentioned Senator Corker. Do, mm -hmm. do you have any more of a reaction to what he said in that op-ed and to some of his uh, proposals, which I guess included putting a, a cap on deductions at $50,000? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have reactions to specific proposals. That I, I'll leave that for the negotiations that are and will continue to take place, I, except to make the point that uh, I uh, just made in response to Jim's question, but also that others have made, and that is that the math has to add up, and, and that's why the rate element of this is so uh, important, because uh, making, you know, proposals about limiting deductions and uh, closing loopholes 
are you know are important, but but it, it, it's not necessarily realistic to assume that they can achieve the kind of uh, revenue target that's necessary for a balanced approach to uh, or solution to these problems. So, uh, you know, the president has proposed uh, closing loopholes and, and capping deductions, uh, and uh, is obviously interested in looking at other proposals along those lines. Uh, but, uh, you know. He has made clear he will not sign an extension of the Bush era tax cuts for the top 2 percent because it's bad economic policy. Uh, and it, uh, doing so would uh, be bad for the middle class and would harm uh, our uh, long term economic prospects uh, and would uh, severely limit our ability to achieve the kind of balanced approach to our fiscal challenges that we have to achieve. I know you said you have no scheduling announcements, but can we expect there to be a meeting this week? I, again, I don't, I don't have a scheduling announcement. I, as I just said, the President spoke with Senator, Lead, uh, Senator Reed and uh, Speaker Boehner over the weekend. Uh, I'm sure he will continue to have uh, conversations and meetings when appropriate. He will be, um, uh, continue to meet with business and civic leaders, uh, as he already has, uh, on this very important issue because so many people have uh, a, a stake in this uh, discussion, in this debate, and, and in the prospect of finding a balanced solution uh, that everybody can agree on. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as I think Alan just made clear, the, the stakes are high and we need to um, address this in a serious way. And, as the, you know, I think there is a growing consensus, uh, a consensus that has long existed but, but growing now in uh, places where uh, that weren't always fertile for growth, uh, that we have to do this in a balanced way and that revenue has to be part of it. And uh, uh, the president looks forward to all the meetings that he's going to have in the, in the coming days and weeks. On one other topic, the president has spoke uh, repeatedly last week with President Morsi of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Was he disappointed or did, was there any sense of betrayal um, from him after the move that, that the president made uh, regarding taking on more powers very shortly after the, the ceasefire happened? Well, no. He uh, spoke uh, on several occasions with uh, President Morsi because uh, President Morsi had uh, such an important role to play in uh, negotiating a ceasefire and uh, he deserves credit for the role he played. Uh, separately, uh, as you know, the State Department and, and, and I here uh, can tell you that we are, you know, have some concerns about um, uh, the decisions and declarations that were announced on November 22nd uh, and those concerns reflect the concerns that many Egyptians uh, have and, and then others in the international community have because we've approached this uh, transformation in Egypt with uh, basic principles in mind and that is that we support democracy. We, 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 we believe that a government in Egypt ought to uh, reflect the will of the people and we believe that uh, you know, the, the Egyptian people have to decide what that government will look like. Uh, so we, we've expressed our concerns uh, but I think that um, on the issue of the role that Egypt played and, and President Morsi played in, in, in achieving a ceasefire uh, on the one hand versus uh, the internal deliberations uh, that are ongoing in Egypt. You know, we have to separate those uh, and acknowledge that President Morsi played a very important role and deserves credit for that. The question is really about the timing. I mean, mm -hmm. they, the President, and you told us it felt like they had started getting a good relationship mm -hmm. during those phone calls, and just right after that, he made this move. So I'm just curious if there is any disappointment there about Morsi using that opportunity after having gotten a lot of accolades uh, to make this power grab. The issue of timing as regards Gaza was one uh, that had to do very specifically with achieving a ceasefire so that lives were saved. But the timing of his move but after Gaza. Again, we see those uh, as separate issues. The, the President's interest was in working with uh, the parties involved uh, to bring help bring about a ceasefire. And President Morsi played a const very constructive role in achieving that. Uh, we have expressed and raised concerns about the decisions and declarations uh, of November 22nd and, uh, you know, will continue to do that as appropriate. The, um, our, our interest in, uh, in, in the development and transition to democracy in Egypt is one that reflects what the Egyptian people demanded through their revolution and continue to demand, which is uh, a government that reflects the will of the people. Uh, and uh, we will continue to work uh, 
towards that goal uh, because it reflects what the Egyptian people want. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Senator John McCain seems to be softening his tone on Ambassador Rice, where before he said he would block a nomination if it were made. Um, now he's showing a willingness to hear her out. Just trying to get your, your reaction to that. Well, I certainly saw those comments and, and appreciate them. As the President has said, and I and others have said, Ambassador Rice has done uh, an excellent job at the United Nations and is highly qualified for any number of positions in the foreign policy arena. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Does the President plan to nominate I have no announcements to make on personnel. I can say that now in case you have questions along those lines. Um, Speaker Boehner in an op-ed talked about, um, in, in terms of the fiscal <coughs> cliff negotiations, that the health care law should be on the table because this is not something that, that this country can afford and uh, certainly all aspects of it should not be kept intact. Um, is that a non-starter? Well, let me just say that congressional leaders of both parties, including the Speaker, have said that uh, Obamacare is the law of the land. The Supreme Court has ruled and upheld uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, implementation continues uh, as we speak and will continue. Uh, and then as a third point, I would note that uh, as we have in the past, although it's often overlooked by those uh, who have advocated for uh, repeal, the Affordable Care Act reduces the deficit considerably. And when we're talking about deficit reduction and taking a balanced approach to deficit reduction, it's important to remember that fact. Uh, but I would simply point, to you, point out to you that the Supreme Court has spoken, uh, the American people have spoken, congressional leaders of both parties have spoken, and, and we are continuing with implementation. Yes. AJ, thanks. On entitlements, last year from uh, this podium, the President expressed openness on part of a, of a major debt deal to means testing Medicare or asking higher income recipients to pay higher premiums. I think his campaign said during the campaign that they would, uh, he would propose a 15 percent hike on premiums for, for re recipients in parts B and D uh, in 2017 down the road. D does that stuff remain on the table and can you give us a sense of what changes are being discussed right now? What I can tell you is what the President has said and that is that he believes and understands that in order to achieve a, uh, a deal, a compromise, that everybody has to make some tough choices and, and he remains committed to that principle. It, it should be noted that through the Affordable Care Act, uh, significant savings uh, in our health care entitlements have already been uh, locked in. Uh, it should be noted that in the President's uh, own proposal in his budget that we he calls for an additional, I believe, $340 billion in uh, savings out of health care programs. Uh, so I think he's demonstrated his seriousness when it comes to uh, recognizing that we need to uh, enact reforms in our entitlement programs that strengthen those programs uh, and produce savings. And, and that's the approach he'll take. But I'm not going to get into the specifics and negotiate uh, line items on what those reforms might look like as part of an overall package. But he understands that that's uh, that, that compromise requires uh, both sides to make tough choices. Again, I'm not going to get into specifics uh, because I think that should be left to the negotiators, left to uh, the leaders. But um, as a general principle, he believes that we you know, that compromise requires compromise and that it requires uh, tough choices on all sides. Can I ask you real quickly on sure. um, the situation in the Congo mm -hmm. that we're seeing uh, unfold in eastern Congo? Um, so the country is on the verge of war by many accounts. It's a humanitarian uh, disaster already. Is the administration engaged on this issue, and, and, and is there any consideration of appointing a, an envoy to the region there? I can tell you that uh, Assistant Secretary Carson is in the region uh, working on this issue. Uh, I would re refer you to the State Department for more uh, on his activity. Uh, the President is updated uh, through his PDB on the issue, uh, on the developments there in the Congo, and is, is obviously very concerned about uh, the violence and the loss of life. Uh, but for more details, I'd refer you to the State Department. Jack? Uh, Jack. Yeah. Um, just two quick things. One is, is when, you, when you say entitlement reform, does that mean Social Security as well? Because sometimes when you've said in the past you've meant Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, when you say it's in there, is that when you say entitlement well, reform? Well, I, I refer to health care. <laughs> programs and health care entitlements. And I, I think that the President has long made clear that uh, he is open to discussions about 
uh, strengthening Social Security uh, as part of a separate track. Uh, because it is in part of this deal. When you say entitlement, when you said the three legs of the stool mm -hmm. and entitlements was one of them, was that also including Social Security? Uh, as, a, uh, as a principle, we believe that we have to address the issues when it comes to a deficit reduction deal that also uh, ensures future economic growth. We should uh, address the uh, drivers of the deficit, and Social Security is not currently a driver of the deficit. That's an economic fact. And uh, while the President supports uh, engaging with Congress on a separate track to strengthen Social Security for the long term. We need to, when it comes to entitlements, we need to look at uh, Medicare and Medicaid as we have already. And I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not going to, I think, I understand that, but sure. we should not assume. You should certainly not assume. That it's that Social Security is part of that when you say entitlements. Correct. And when the administration says entitlements. Um, the second is, given what um, Mr. Kruger came out and said, does the White House have an opinion on the fiscal cliff divers, if you will, those, those in the Senate, some Senate Democrats who say, hey, go over the cliff? Are you saying don't? Is this are you guys asking them not to do this? Asking them to, are they wrong? Well, they're we're wrong engaged. Of your, of your own party. We're engaged in a process here that has a goal of achieving a bipartisan compromise for a reason, because we believe that uh, the best answer for the economy is to reach that compromise uh, before the end of the year. Uh, I, I think you know, Alan uh, effectively laid out uh, one of the reasons why we need to uh, address this issue because of its impact, uh, it, because of the impact of raising taxes on the middle class, for example, uh, and uh, would have on the economy, on consumer confidence, on retailers, and uh, overall spending. And uh, you know, so the president's approach here has always been, you know, what's best for the economy, what's best for the middle class, what's going to keep our recovery moving uh, and hopefully speed it up, lead to stronger economic growth and even stronger job creation. Uh, because we were all here, we know how deep the hole was uh, at the depths of the Great Recession. And, uh, you know, his primary objective as president has been and will continue to be strengthening the middle class, creating more opportunities for those uh, who aspire to the middle class to get there. Uh, and, you know, that it certainly is his position that we, that these are solvable problems. So are fiscal and that we cliff can diving irresponsible? Well, I don't, I, I don't know what fiscal cliff diving Meaning, specifically yeah, means. Saying, let it, let, let it all go and then Look, I think wait until after the year. You know, you're talking about sort of, uh, I think, uh, political analysis of an economic impact, and, and our interest is in uh, achieving a deal that uh, maximizes benefits for the middle class, maximizes benefits for the economy, uh, and that is best achieved, I think, uh, before the end of the year. Uh, yes, Major, welcome. Thank I didn't you. realize you were starting so soon. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Neither did I. Well, anyway. <laughs> uh, first on Egypt, uh, what does the President believe is happening? There. Some people have described it as an autocratic power grab, as something that is injurious to the revolution, that's hostile to it. What specifically does the president believe is happening right now? And when you say he's registered some concerns, what specifically are those concerns, and to what degree is the administration involved in trying to resolve them? Well, let me just say that one of the aspirations of the Egyptian revolution was to ensure that power would not be overly concentrated in the hands of any one person or institution. And the United States supports Egypt's democratic transition, uh, consistent with Egypt's international commitments and the democratic principles that Egyptians fought so hard to secure. Democracy depends on strong institutions and the important checks and balances that provide accountability. Um, it's our view that the current constitutional impasse can only be resolved by the adoption of a constitution that respects fundamental freedoms, individual rights, and the rule of law consistent with Egypt's international commitments and is written through a consultative, consultative, inclusive process. And so we call for calm and we encourage all parties to work together and call for Egyptians to resolve their differences over these important issues peacefully. So, uh, you know, there's a process underway in Egypt. Uh, and I think we've long made clear a process that was going on before Prime Minister Morsi made these moves, or you're talking about his process? No, I'm talking about the process that began with okay. the revolution right. and a democratic transition that's, that uh, I think everyone knew would not be 
uh, perfectly smooth. And, uh, but that is important to continue because it's in the interest of the Egyptian people and it, it is the President's belief that it is in the uh, national interest of the United States and the American people that that process continue uh, and that a government uh, in Egypt uh, reflect the will of the Egyptian people and that it uh, respects the rights of minorities, that it, that it uh, gives voice to Egyptians so that they can uh, help their economy grow and help, and help uh, their culture flourish. So, you know, we uh, have been and continue to be engaged very uh, substantially with Egypt as that process continues and when there are reasons to raise concerns, we raise them. Has the President raised this specifically on the phone or in any other way with Prime Minister Morsi? Uh, he has not spoken uh, uh, with President Morsi since, uh, as, as I understand, since the uh, ceasefire. Uh, but if I have updates on foreign calls, I'll, I'll, I'll bring them to your attention. Okay. On the fiscal cliff, shortly before this briefing, Senator McConnell described the talks on the fiscal cliff as at an impasse. And he said it is up to the President to break that impasse. And if he doesn't, it won't be broken. It's that simple. Would you like to respond to that? Do you think we're, this is at an impasse already? Uh, we remain uh, hopeful and optimistic that we can achieve a deal. You don't disagree that it's an impasse? Though. Well, I think that there are issues that need to be resolved, but we've been very clear about uh, both the President's uh, interest in and willingness to compromise, uh, but also his clear uh, insistence that he will not sign an extension of Bush-era tax cuts for the top 2 percent, for those making over $250,000. Is he and his, about his, that position as he is about avoiding going over the cliff? I, I don't think that's a choice uh, that has to be made here. The, here here's, here's the problem with that dynamic, and I think it's both a, uh, more importantly, a substantive economic issue, but, but also a political issue for those who advocate holding middle class tax cuts hostage to uh, tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. It's untenable. It's bad economic policy and it is untenable politically because uh, I don't think members on Capitol Hill uh, would look forward to explaining to their constituents why uh, on average their tax cuts for almost all of their constituents went up uh, at the beginning of the year. I mean rather the ta that, that uh, they lost those tax cuts and their, and their taxes went up at the beginning of the year uh, because they insisted that millionaires and billionaires uh, needed a tax cut too. I, I just don't think that's, that's politically palatable to most members of Congress. So, you know, we, we believe that there's a way to get from here to there. We're actively engaged with our Capitol Hill counterparts uh, and with businesses both large and small. Uh, and other stakeholders in this process. And we, you know, we, we're going to continue and hopefully get to uh, a deal that, that works and that broadly can be supported. Last question on this. How about the optics? There are some Americans who say, you know, or they might react and say a phone call on a weekend to Senator Reid and Speaker Boehner that doesn't really suggest presidential muscularity. Why not have more frequent meetings? Why not do this more in a, in a more structured way? that has several days committed to. Address the optics for those Americans who say, this sounds urgent to me. I'm beginning to get right. nervous about this. Why isn't the President, at least to my point of view, engaged more directly on a more persistent basis to get this deal, which you said is achievable? Well, Major, as you know, the President met with congressional leaders here in the White House uh, prior to uh, his trip to Asia and, and uh, spoke with uh, the leader of the Senate and the leader of the House over the weekend and will continue to engage with congressional leaders going forward. I am highly confident that for the most part outside of the Beltway, out beltway uh, the preoccupation among the American people over this issue is simply that they want action. As the President said, the mandate he has is the same mandate that everyone else who was elected has, which is for action uh, and not for political posturing and certainly not for the proposition that uh, tax cuts ought to go up on 98 percent of the American people uh, unless the top 2 percent get tax cuts. So, you know, I know there's a school of thought that uh, imagines that uh, meetings are 
you know, the sole way to accomplish a deal. What, what I think was clear from what I said earlier, uh, quoting uh, Senator Corker, is that we know what the parameters of a deal look like. We know what the substance beneath the parameters of the deal uh, look like. And uh, we are working, as we speak, with uh, our counterparts on Capitol Hill to try to uh, reach that goal. And the President will meet with not just congressional leaders, but others who have uh, an enormous stake in resolving these issues, uh, both this week and going forward. And, uh, you know, his goal is to protect the middle class, help it grow, and help those uh, who are, uh, who aspire to getting into the middle class. Um, and, and to make sure that uh, he's true to those principles when he sits down with congressional leaders, when he sits down with business leaders, when he sits down with uh, civic leaders. Yeah. Jay, on a uh, major question of muscularity in terms of leadership, um, when the President's economic team is saying this is such an urgent priority, we've heard that the President may go public, may go on the road, et cetera. Um, why hasn't he started even making public comments on this when you have um, some Democrats, as Chuck said, saying let's just go off the cliff, other Democrats saying protect our domestic priorities. I know we spoke with Boehner before the Asia trip, made, made some public comments, but why have we heard very little from the President directly to the American people? Well, I, I know in my home and in most Americans' home, last week was about Thanksgiving. Uh, it certainly was for the President uh, and for, I, I assume for the Speaker and, and others. Uh, he spoke, uh, he made a uh, public statement about it. He gave a press conference where he discussed it at length uh, with, with you and others. Uh, and uh, will continue to do so. And it is certainly true that public communication is essential. Uh, and uh, we are always looking for ways to uh, engage the public in a debate like this, because everyone here should be acting on the public's behalf. And hearing from them, hearing their voices, uh, and hearing their priorities is essential to helping compel this process forward. Uh, so we are actively engaged. I think you've seen a number of uh, measures that we've taken to try to uh, bring the public into this discussion, and we'll continue to do that going forward. One other topic, James Clapper, over the break, there was, he faced some heat from uh, lawmakers who were upset that he at first said he didn't know why the Benghazi talking points were changed, why Al-Qaeda was taken out of it, why <clears throat> the word terrorism was taken out. Um, and now he's saying that, that it was the DNI office. Um, does the President still have confidence in the DNI? Absolutely. You asked Margaret. Thanks. Um, I had a couple questions around um, President Obama's upcoming <coughs> meeting with the Mexican President elect mm -hmm. on immigration and on um, gun control. And I'm wondering um, what kind of assurances can the President uh, give the incoming Mexican leader about any improved prospects for immigration reform? And um, if we can revisit the topic of the assault weapons ban, um, do is he looking at pushing for a reintroduction of the ban anytime soon? Can you tell us anything specific? And is this going to be part of their discussions to, um, when they meet? I, I don't have an agenda for their discussion. I think it is um, something the president looks forward to meeting the uh, uh, president elect of Mexico, president elect Nina. Uh, uh, sorry, I got. Thank you. Um, but uh, as for immigration reform, I can tell you that the President does believe, as he's made clear, made clear uh, I think on election night and has uh, uh, frequently since, that there is a real opportunity here to move forward. And the President's committed to that. He, he believes that comprehensive immigration reform uh, is achievable, uh, that it requires bipartisan support, and that that is achievable because there has been in the past uh, bipartisan support for immigration reform. Uh, and he, and uh, he thinks it's uh, important not just for uh, specific communities that would be affected by it, but for the American economy. Uh, and uh, will be pressing for action on immigration reform. Uh, and to the extent that might come up in the President's meeting with the President-elect, uh, that would be his message. I believe that uh, the 2012 general election results uh, give the Republicans added incentive to get on board with the immigration reform deal. Is that something that he would tell the uh, incoming Mexican leader? Well, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think it is certainly true that um, 
there's been a lot of analysis around that subject, and uh, um, the president is certainly a keen observer of uh, politics in Washington and how they work. And um, I don't think any of us would disagree with the general proposition that there is uh, both substantive and a political incentive to try to achieve immigration reform uh, when it comes to the Republicans. Weapons well, the president has long supported the reinstatement uh, of that. Uh, he, when he's asked about this, and was not that long ago, you know, made clear that uh, Congress, uh, that, that there are issues here in dealing with Congress on uh, taking those kinds of measures. Uh, so I don't have any update for you on uh, what his approach will be moving forward. But but he has certainly supported reinstatement. Mr. Nakamura. Uh, follow up on Ed's question, just pressing for more details. Is the president planning to go on the road um, between now and the end of the year to talk about the fiscal cliff? Or do you feel like he, he did that during the campaign when he went from stop to stop? I will stick to the general principle that communicating with the public on uh, this issue and others is very important, uh, but I don't have any. Uh, travel announcements to make today. Travel is anything else? I mean, you guys have brought other regular Americans to the White mm -hmm. House at times. You've, you know, started even Twitter hashtags around mm -hmm. these kind of subjects uh, very effectively for the payroll tax cut debate last year. Can you give us any guidance about how the president intends to harness this public? I, I would simply say that uh, all of us here, I think, are uh, have a better and clearer understanding about how to engage the public in uh, these important policy debates because these policy debates are about the American people. They are about the American middle class. And, and everyone on an issue like this has a deep uh, interest and stake in the outcome. And we will continue to uh, bring the American people into these debates using a variety of means. Uh, but I don't have a specific. Way to, I mean, what it would ruin the fun if I gave you all the details now. Well, what, what can you talk at all, though, about what I mean, the president said during the campaign, send a message, break the deadlock. Um, you know, uh, we can't change Washington inside, we need it from the outside. Mm -hmm. it seems, uh, did the election send that message already? Or is there more you can do in, in the next month to harness that? No, I, I think the President was serious uh, uh, about that going forward, not just uh, looking back. And, and uh, we need to continue to engage the public because that's what this is about. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that some of the lessons that we learned over the last four years uh, have to do with uh, always being mindful of the fact that the engaging the public on these sometimes you know, chewy uh, <coughs> policy debates is important because uh, they care and they uh, have a deep stake in the outcome of the debate. So we'll continue to do that. Peter. Thank you, Jack. Um, is the President, um, as you do a reevaluation re the last four years, is the President likely to change the way he engages members of Congress? For example, we've seen in past uh, years President uh, play golf with John Boehner. We've seen him invite members over for watch football games, things like that. There's been talk of uh, him inviting members to Camp David. Um, might these kinds of steps be helpful in deepening relationships on Capitol Hill, which could in turn be effective in advancing the President's agenda? Well, look, the President is very interested in engaging with lawmakers of both parties in order to achieve you know, their shared goals, which have to do with growing the economy, increasing job creation, making America safer and stronger. Uh, and he will continue to do that. You cited some uh, ways that he did that in his first term. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm confident he'll continue to do that. I think that, uh, you know, the r reality of, you know, modern day Washington is a little different than it was in 1801, to use a timely example. And uh, uh, so the, the, you know, the notion that you can solve all problems over a cocktail, I think, is a little overrated. But uh, he is certainly interested in engaging not just with lawmakers, but uh, you know, civic leaders, business leaders, labor leaders, and others uh, on all these important issues. Because as I was saying earlier, engaging with uh, not just uh, the denizens of Washington, but with the broader American public is very important to him. Jake. Donovan. Jake, I wanted to ask about Afghanistan and there's been 
in the reports that the president had decided on the troop levels that he wants after 2014. Is that the case, and is it 10 Well, it's not the case, and I'm not sure that the report you're citing says that he's decided. He has not. Uh, he will uh, review options uh, for uh, both. There are, two, there are two things to look at here, as we've made clear, and the President made clear when he visited Afghanistan uh, not that long ago, that um, we will uh, entertain the, uh, a continued presence in Afghanistan that, will that, that, might foc that would focus, if there is a continued presence, on counterterrorism operations and training of Afghan forces. Uh, and that's continued beyond the 2014 deadline when we will uh, wind down uh, our participation in the war in Afghanistan. The separate issue, again, that he has not reviewed options on and has not made any decisions on is fulfillment of his commitment that he made very clearly uh, to continue to draw down forces in Afghanistan from their levels now that we've drawn down the surge forces uh, over the course of the next two years. Uh, and, and the pace of that drawdown uh, is a decision that he will be making, uh, you know, in coming, in coming weeks and months. So is the, the report suggested that General John Allen had recommended between six, leaving between 6,000 and 15,000 U.S. troops there. Is that, uh, well, is I, that you know, not true? I'm not, that's, that's different from what you said, which is the President had decided on any, and he has not decided on anything. Uh, he will re evaluate proposals from uh, the Pentagon and elsewhere on what we might negotiate with uh, the Afghan government uh, f uh, on a future uh, presence in Afghanistan uh, after we fulfill uh, our commitment and NATO's commitment to uh, end the war in Afghanistan in 2014. Uh, that commitment and that presence would be very limited in scope, as we've talked about, focused on counterterrorism operations and training of Afghan forces. And yeah. very last one, uh, business, meeting with business leaders today, um, did he meet with the chamber, Tom Donahoe from the chamber? and other business leaders, and is he making progress on that? Uh, the President did not have meetings with business leaders today. I believe uh, uh, Tom Donahue and, and, and John Angler in separate, uh, separate meetings are meeting with uh, uh, some senior folks over here, Jack Liu, Gene Sperling, Jeff Zients. But uh, that's part of the process that we're engaged in uh, that uh, I described earlier, which is an ongoing conversation with uh, leaders in Capitol Hill, uh, rank and file members on Capitol Hill, staff on Capitol Hill, and, and business leaders, small and large, uh, as well as civic and labor and other leaders, uh, who all have a stake in this very important debate. Christy. Thank you, Jay. Did, uh, did the President Mark. meet with other stakeholders today, um, meetings that aren't on the public schedule? Uh, not th that I uh, am aware of, no. And also, you mentioned uh, at the top that you came out here to say that the President had spoken to the, to the Speaker and to Senator Reid over the weekend. Did you say everything you could say about that? I did. <laughs> I did. How, how long the call lasted? On I don't have uh, any more details for you, but I, I know it had, it had begun to get out that he had had these conversations, so uh, I was prepared to you know, break some news and confirm those uh, reports. Um, can you say this? Uh, were you planning? Did did you guys did the White House leave the schedule open today in hopes that a meeting would develop? And is that no. the plan for the rest of the week? No, I got some open spots. The, the president will continue to engage with leaders of Congress uh, as appropriate as this process moves forward. And that the process we are engaging uh, with Congress uh, at the staff and member level on this important uh, discussion, and we'll continue to do that. The president will meet. Uh, continue to meet with business leaders and other leaders uh, this week. He'll continue to uh, engage in different ways uh, on this issue uh, in the hope of achieving uh, a goal here, which he knows and believes is widely shared by the American people, which is a balanced uh, solution to our uh, longer-term deficit challenges, a solution that protects the middle class, uh, that protects seniors, uh, that makes sure we're making the necessary investments in our economy and infrastructure and research and development and education that help that will help the economy grow uh, for years into the future. Uh, all of that is achievable. And, uh, you know, with a little give, we can get it done. Uh, Mark. Jay, when you say that a deal is best achieved before the end of the year, um, does that rule out the President agreeing to kicking it over into next year? 
Well, I, I'm not going to. The point was, I was asked if if he uh, supports the what did you call them fiscal cliff divers, and and it is our belief that copyright. I mean, copyright. <laughs> it is our belief and the president's belief that, uh, as spelled out in Allen in the in the plan that Allen presented to you today, that was co-authored by the CEA and the NEC, uh, that you know there would be damage done uh, to the economy if. Uh, we don't extend the tax cuts for the middle class, and if we don't address the other elements of the fiscal cliff, and if we don't, more broadly speaking, uh, you know, address our longer-term fiscal challenges in a way that grows the economy and creates jobs. So uh, we believe we can get this done, and that's what we're working on. Thanks, Chair. One more? Um, let's see, Olivier, then Alexis, and then April, and then right. we'll, but let's. A couple on Egypt. You've said repeatedly that we have expressed concerns. Do you know who in the administration addressed who in the Egyptian government? Well, I'd refer you to the State Department. They have more specifics. And um, were you forewarned that Mr. Morsi was going to do this, or was the administration caught by surprise? Well, I, again, we review these as separate issues. So the, it, these were not, this was not of it. I didn't link it to any issues. No, I, I understand. But, uh, you know, I think we have raised our concerns, and I think that in part answers your question, but the, the President was focused on and Secretary Clinton was focused on uh, working with President Morsi and others, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, to uh, help bring about a ceasefire uh, so that lives could be saved and that uh, the possibility of moving forward on uh, negotiations for a more enduring peace uh, could be realized. And, uh, and that was very important, and President Morsi played an important role in that. Uh, separately, we've raised concerns about some of the decisions and declarations that were made on November 22nd, and we, you know, we continue to engage with the Egyptians on this. And I think that the, the important issue here is uh, that the Egyptian people uh, want a, a, a government that reflects their will, and uh, we certainly support that. Alexis. Because the fiscal discussions are aiming at deficit reduction, and that's the goal, and because it was murky before Thanksgiving, can you clarify the President is shooting for $4 trillion in deficit reduction over 10 years at least? That is his goal? Well, it's reflected, yes, it's reflected in his proposal, his budget proposal, which I know you all have read cover to cover, and, and is still the most substantive proposal uh, put forward by any elected official uh, that actually achieves uh, the target of $4 trillion in deficit reduction and over 10 years and, and does it in a balanced way. And today, where we are today on Monday, is there consensus around that? Can we say there's consensus among all parties that $4 trillion is the goal? Well, I don't want to speak for other parties. I think that that's the President's goal when we talk about the longer term issues, which are, you know, part of, but certainly separate from the specific fiscal cliff challenges. Uh, that has been his position for a long time. He's He has described that going back to uh, the spring and summer of 2011 as a big deal, one that would be, uh, that would help uh, put us on a sustainable path and, and create the kind of uh, ratio of, uh, you know, deficit to GDP that, you know, Alan Kruger and others are so uh, fluid in discussing. But, um, you know, that is his goal. Uh, when we talk about the longer-term deficit uh, reduction target, the, the near-term target, one that could be resolved tomorrow, uh, if the House so desired, would be to pass the extension of the middle class tax cuts, uh, which would remove a substantial portion of the fiscal cliff right away, would give certainty to consumers and retailers right away. Uh, and we, the President, as he has uh, repeatedly, urges the House to do that because we shouldn't hold the middle class hostage. We shouldn't hold 98 percent of the American people hostage. Uh, to an insistence that millionaires and billionaires and, and those making from 250000 to a million uh, get, get tax cuts going forward. Uh, it's just not good economic policy and it's certainly not good politics. Jane, two yeah, questions. Yeah, last person. Uh, because of all that's happening, all the historical events that's happened in the past year in Egypt, could we see the President now, because concerns, you have raised concerns about what's happening since November 22nd, could we see this President reach out, uh, direct talks or direct communicate? President Morrissey uh, to, to ask, what are you doing? What is this? Well, the President, as you know, uh, 
spoke on numerous occasions with President Morsi, Morsi over the, uh, uh, the violence in Gaza and, and, and had spoken to him and before that and will continue to speak to him going forward. Uh, I, I'm confident of that, but I don't have a, a, a planned uh, schedule for you of conversations or an agenda for what those conversations would look like. We're, you know, our, we've, we've raised concerns. Uh, I think the State Department put out a statement on this. Or, uh, uh, Toria Newland addressed it in a briefing, and, and I think the State Department might have more information for you on, on uh, you know, specifically how, how we've communicated those concerns. But, uh, you know, our interest is in the process, the transition towards democracy continuing, and, and the development of a government that reflects uh, the will of the Egyptian people. Uh, and we're working towards that. Uh, both because we believe it's in the interest of the American people and of the United States, but also because it reflects the will and the interest of the Egyptian people. Does it look like democracy is in the process, or does it look like there could be a transformation into dictatorship? Well, look, I, I, I think that it's important to s take a step back in November of 2012 and look at how much the world has changed in that region since late 2010, and how much Egypt has changed since very early 2011. And that transition, uh, if anyone ever promised that it would be smooth, uh, they were foolhardy because uh, that was never going to be the case. Uh, the President focuses on the basic principles that guide his policy towards Egypt and guide his policy towards uh, the overall region when it comes to countries that are attempting to transition to democracy. Sorry, and this is disruptive. Would you? Again, we've raised concerns about it, uh, and we wouldn't if we, uh, you know, if there weren't, How if we didn't have concerns. concerns. That State Department press release, well, that State Department release in, in your, I mean, you've been very careful in what you said. You haven't really been critical. It I think like you're concerned, but not critical. Well, I think and what's I important here is, is, is careful choice of words, well, I think it is, and I think that, what is important here is that uh, the transition to democracy will be achieved by the Egyptian people, not by uh, the manner in which we raise concerns. Uh, we have done that and will continue to do that where appropriate. And we are you know, constantly monitoring developments in Egypt and working with uh, the Egyptians, with whom we have a very important relationship. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, again, it's important to take a longer view here which is not to say that the concerns that have been raised aren't uh, significant and serious, because they are, and we, do, we raise those concerns as appropriate. Uh, but it is important to, again, look at what the goals are, on whose behalf those goals are being achieved, and that's the Egyptian people's you're behalf. You're not condemning it to parse this. You're not condemning what he's I, doing. I, I, I certainly don't have, any, I don't have any new careful? language to give to you today on how our view on it is, what our view on it is. If but one I would, of us wrote or said critical White House is criticizing President Morsi. Would you say that was in an incorrect take? I would say that we uh, are concerned about it and have raised those concerns. Um, Jay, I got to go. Jay, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> is, how is the nomination process coming with the President on all of the key posts that are open, but also could we expect something before the 36 days of the fiscal cliff deadline? And who's it going to be? <laughs> Let's get, uh, Let's get that out of the way. I have no, I have, as I said earlier, I have no. Uh, personnel news to make of any kind. No timelines. I don't have anything for you. Again, I don't have anything for you. focusing primarily on averting the fiscal cliff? That's an important piece of business, but it is uh, not the only piece of business. Thanks, guys. Thank you.